Reed is an adult driving his car around Wyoming when he spotted a convenience store beside a gas station on a highway. He thought he could use some of his time to park his vehicle and rest before driving around again. He parked his car on the far side of the gas station since the parking spaces in front of the convenience store were already occupied. After he parked his vehicle, Reed immediately went inside the convenience store to buy himself some food and drinks. After buying some food and drinks, Reed sat in front of a table inside the convenience store to eat. He could already feel tired and frustrated from all his driving since he's been driving for hours when he passed by Wyoming. While eating peacefully, Reed noticed a strange black figure standing beside his car from a distance. He thought he just saw things, so he didn't mind it at first. When he finished his food, he decided to leave the convenience store immediately and head back to his car to rest some more. As soon as he got back, he was surprised to see a black bear trying to open the car door of the shotgun seat. Reed froze in his place, as he didn't know what to do, until he removed his shoe and threw it at the bear to make it back away. As he threw a shoe, he didn't expect what would happen next. Instead of backing away, the bear was intimidated and growled as it immediately charged in Reed's direction. Reed felt his pockets quickly for his car keys as he sprinted to get inside his car just before the bear could get him. He ran for the car seat in time, but the black bear grabbed him by the leg before he could close the car door. Reed was being forcefully dragged outside by the bear as he repeatedly squirmed and kicked the bear's face. After a few seconds, he kicked as hard as possible, making the bear release his leg and let him go before running away. Reed made it back into the car again and drove away with his leg still wounded to find help. He hasn't gotten his shoe back after it was thrown at the bear. Still, he nevertheless is grateful to have survived the incident without suffering significant injuries from the ferocious beast. The bear species are not exclusive to polar bears, grizzly bears, or black bears. There are still lesser known types of bears that are yet to be paid attention to and noticed. One of these bears is the sloth bear, a specific bear species native to the forests and woodlands of India, southern Nepal, and Sri Lanka. They weigh no more than 500 pounds and are smaller than other species of bears, but they are considered one of the most dangerous animals in the wild and one of the deadliest animals in India. Although their diet consists of termites and ants, they are still responsible for several bear attack incidents, especially in India. One particular and unusual sloth bear to date is the sloth bear of Mysore, which is a sloth bear that is infamously known to have killed 12 people and injured 30 more in 1957. In today's video, you're about to witness the most bone-chilling and terrifying encounter of a woman with a sloth bear that almost ripped her face off. An 84-year-old woman in India named Lalita Patel decided to share her story about her encounter with the infamous sloth bear of Mysore and how the bear almost took her life by attempting to rip her face off. The then 19-year-old Lalita decided to spend her vacation in Mysore, her hometown. The Mysore state back then was full of forests, trees, woodlands, and diverse environments. Lalita decided to stay at her aunt's house in Nagvara Hills, a place a hundred miles away from Bangalore. As soon as Lalita got to her aunt's house, her cousins were happy to see her and greeted her with open arms. The warm greetings she got from her relatives touched Lalita, which is why she had already started getting drawn to the place. Aside from being around nature and various environments, it can also help Lalita ease her stress and be happy once in a while. When afternoon came, Lalita was approached by two of her cousins, who were also 19-year-olds, named Emir and Prima. Lalita was asked questions by the two, and the three of them quickly got along with each other. While they were talking, Emir mentioned an infamous sloth bear lurking in the woodlands of Nagvara Hills, and is currently terrorizing the people in their area. This was the first time Lalita heard about a sloth bear, so she quickly became curious and eager to hear more about it. Despite what Emir had been telling her, she was fascinated by sloth bears rather than terrified of them. Prima added that the sloth bear had already killed six people and injured countless working within the woodlands to hunt for food or animals. These details about this infamous sloth bear have made Lalita even more curious. Lalita asked Emir and Prima if they could take her to where the sloth bear lived. 
but they refused. They told Lolita that it was best for her to stay inside and be safe, as the bear's reign of terror was still there in their area. However, Lolita was very curious and just wanted to know where the sloth bear lived or what they looked like. Ymir and Prima had no choice but to take her outside to feed her curiosity. When they were already outside, the three immediately headed to the woods to point out where the sloth bear lived to Lalita. After a few minutes of walking in the woods, they arrived at a meadow and were greeted by the cold breeze. Mir and Prima stated that the area was the site of the majority of the sloth bear assaults and the deaths of all eight victims. Lalita was intrigued by the unusual bear's appearance, even though she feared its potential for violence. The three decided to return home right away as they were finished. They were aware that the sloth bear was nearby and might ambush them and harm at least one of them. While walking in the woods, Prima heard footsteps beside Emir's path. The three decided to stop for a minute to observe what was causing the footsteps and what they should do about it. When they realized the footsteps were getting closer and faster, they decided to run as fast as they could. While they were running, the footsteps also became fast, causing the three to get anxious and run away faster than they have ever run. As soon as they got out of the woods, they immediately headed home and decided not to tell their older relatives so they wouldn't be temporarily restrained from going outside. After the encounter, Lalita was sleepless and had been thinking of what was chasing her and her two cousins that day. As the days passed, the number of people that the sloth bear had unfortunately killed went from six to nine in just days. The next day, Lolita asked Amir and Prima if they could accompany her to the woods to see the sloth bear. Amir told Lolita that she was crazy for trying to get a glimpse of the deadly creature, but Lolita insisted that she was just curious and that she won't do anything stupid. She also assured Amir and Prima that she was fine and it was okay if she would see just the creature's face. Amir and Prima were convinced and agreed to let Lolita venture into the woods again with them. This time, Emir brought a torch while Prima brought a makeshift wooden spear to protect themselves in case the aggressive sloth bear might come and attack them. As they reached the meadow they visited before, the three saw the sloth bear resting at a distance, staring at them. Lolita was amazed by its appearance. It didn't seem as big as the other bear species. Lolita was fascinated and satisfied that she had already seen a sloth bear. With Lolita's excitement about the sloth bear comes Emir and Prima becoming agitated over the fact that this might be the sloth bear of Mysore that is responsible for numerous deaths and injuries of the people around their area. Emir held on tightly to his torch and made sure that the wind wouldn't blow the fire so they could have something to defend themselves in case they were the next ones to be targeted by the infamous bear. After a few minutes, the trio decided to head back as Prima didn't feel good about what they were doing. They moved cautiously as they left the meadow to avoid the bear's attention. The three heaved a sigh of relief as soon as they got out. While they were walking outside, they were surprised not to hear those weird footsteps that they heard. Lolita showed that she was also glad that the footsteps were gone, but deep down, she was terrified of what would happen next. They thought everything was peaceful until suddenly a sloth bear jumped out of the bush and directly tackled Lolita to the ground before dragging her into the meadow. Emir and Prima became terrified as they were also shocked about what happened, but they knew they must save their cousin. Lolita screamed and cried as the sloth bear dragged her by the legs. She tried her best to squirm and move around, but the bear wasn't planning on letting her go that easily. Emir and Prima followed the bear and Lalita until they reached the meadow, where Lalita was tackled on the ground by the sloth bear, who got on top to mutilate her face. Indeed, this is the sloth bear of Mysore, responsible for nine deaths and countless injuries. The sloth bear began to slash Lalita's body with its long clawed paws and even attempted to bite her arm. Lalita was screaming in excruciating pain as Emir and Prima were almost clueless about what to do to help Lalita. After thinking of a way, Emir decided that they should ward off the bear with their weapons and try to look scary, even just for once. As they discussed what they were about to do with the bear, Lalita was now screaming in pain as the sloth bear slashed her face twice. Blood was already dripping from Lalita's body as Emir and Prima bravely walked over to the gruesome scenario and tried to scare the sloth bear off Lalita. 
Emir waved his torch in front of the sloth bear, while Prima aimed the spear's tip at the bear in case it attacked them. After a few tries, they successfully scared off the sloth bear, but Lolita was left there bloody and unconscious. Emir and Prima immediately took Lolita back home to get treatment for her wounds. She was then taken to a hospital to get immediate treatment. After the attack, the sloth bear of Mysore killed three more victims, making it 12. Because of this concerning number, an Indian writer and hunter named Kenneth Anderson decided to venture into Mysore to conduct an expedition to end the killing saga of the infamous sloth bear. The trip was successful as Anderson shot the sloth bear before succumbing to death. After killing the sloth bear, everyone's lives returned to normal, and they were glad to be living everyday lives again. It was a cold day like any other day at the North Pole when Mark saw the white polar bear before him. It was staring right at him as if taken by surprise with his presence, and Mark was oblivious on what to do. His heart was pounding so loud that he thought it could jump out of his chest at any moment. His eyes were wide and he felt frozen in place, unable to move. The bear started walking towards him slowly almost cautiously, as though it would scare him away. He stayed rooted where he stood for some time, too scared to even take a step backwards. Finally, as the bear got closer, it let out a low rumble and tilted its head. The noise sent shivers down Mark's spine, and the adrenaline rushed through him. He turned around and bolted away as quickly as possible, his heart still thundering inside his chest. The bear charged after Mark, and he heard the growl right behind his back. He was running for his dear life, hoping to God that he would find a way to escape this. Soon, he felt the bear swipe and tear his clothes, barely missing his flesh, and he fell to the ground and briskly released his bag from his back, which he used as a line of defense between him and the bear. As the bear growled, he used that time to get out a can of bear spray, and he readied it, Mark looked over his shoulder and saw the bear standing just a few feet away, glaring at him. He aimed at the animal, but didn't spray the contents of the can yet. He was waiting for it to come close enough before he unleashed the can's furious content. The bear began charging again, and Mark knew he couldn't outrun it. He waited with his finger shaky on the trigger. Mark squeezed the trigger and sprayed a large amount of foam in front of him, aiming it directly at the bear. Then he waited for a reaction. He heard a yelp and looked up just in time to see the bear stumble backward a bit, surprised that it didn't get sprayed. Mark waited anxiously for the creature to charge back at him, but it remained on the side of the clearing, seemingly confused by the sudden attack from the raging spray can. This gave Mark time to catch his breath. The bear stood there with furrowed brows until the last drops of the spray had faded away. After a while, the animal turned around and walked away, leaving behind nothing but empty woods as he left. Mark took a deep breath of relief and exhaled slowly. He sat there for a moment, taking in all that had happened since they arrived here that day. Gary had a close bear encounter that almost claimed his life up in the North Pole. Gary was unsure exactly how long he'd been out there, but it felt like forever, trapped with nothing but the cold to keep him company as he waited for rescue. He was certain that by now, they would have noticed his absence and would send search parties to retrieve what part of him remained. Thankfully, he was still whole. He had been one of those who had gone out to explore in groups, but he had taken a detour, telling everyone that he was right on their trail as he needed to examine the ice and take notes for his research. It was then he'd lost track of time, and then the snow had come to cover up their trail. The cold made him think about his mortality, but it was nothing like the growl of a bear behind him, which made him forget the cold in an instant that he stopped shivering as his eyes widened with horror. Gary spun around to face the creature. It was large enough to easily crush him in its jaws, and it was staring directly at him from only a few feet away. The sight alone 
made him freeze in fear. His legs buckled beneath him. He couldn't even scream as he fell to the ground. He tried desperately to roll into some place out of the way as he stared up at this massive beast's snout. He couldn't stop shaking as it sniffed and came closer. Gary began to tremble. Then he heard voices shouting orders nearby. There were shouts and footsteps approaching quickly, but no one else seemed to be here, so he assumed they hadn't noticed him yet. He held his breath as he prepared himself for what would happen next, which he wasn't sure if it was the bear killing him or the men finding him right before the bear attacked him, or most probably when it was about to kill him. Gary heard whispers and crunching footsteps behind him, and he saw the bear look at both sides of him as if something else had its attention. Don't try to move, an unfamiliar voice said. Even Gary's legs wouldn't let him, so that was highly unlikely. He knew fear to come in different ways. It sucked that his had decided to seize him and freeze his legs to the spot when he was supposed to be running toward the voices. Just when Gary was about to confirm whether they were with guns, he heard the cocking of various rifles behind him, and for once, he felt safe. He could move his legs, and this time, he took a step back, and just then, several shots rang in the air, scaring the bear and causing it to turn and run. Gary sighed and sighed. He was glad to be alive. He watched the bear become smaller and smaller till it was out of sight. Today's story takes us to Red Lake, Ontario, where a man who had gone camping met a fate which no one should have to endure. Capable of lifting over 500 kilograms and with a bite force strong enough to crush a bowling ball, the grizzly bear is one of the most feared bears across America, Canada, and Alaska. They are extremely ferocious, territorial, and exceedingly dangerous when agitated. With 11 people killed every year by this creature, the odds might seem extremely low, but the chances are you wouldn't be prepared to deal with their hostility when it comes running straight at you. Jonathan Myers was an avid outdoorsman. As a boy, he had loved camping, going out with his father during the weekends, and spending time in the great outdoors getting used to living life in the wilderness. As he got older, he decided to do it more and even became a guide for one of the cabin houses around Red Lake. He took hikers and campers through the trails and often would show them bears and deer and other wild creatures which called the great wilderness their home. Jonathan was great at his job and more than anything, he absolutely enjoyed it. He understood the risk involved with living out there and he explained this to the younger campers who would decide to bed down for the night. Jonathan knew that nature was only as friendly as the guy you walked by on the street. At the slightest occurrence, everything could change, and one had to be prepared for that. He was always prepared. In his Jeep, he carried a tranquilizer rifle which he could use for bigger targets, knowing that there were bears and pumas lurking around. He also had hooks for snakes and nets to hold down badgers. Jonathan had worked with the park for the last five years without any incident. All his campers had returned fine, and the same with the hikers as well. With such stellar performance, Jonathan usually had a lot of free time on his hands and used it to map out the place, exploring past the known and available regions of the wilderness, trying to see how far he could go and then navigate his way back to the campsite. Sometimes he would hike too far out and would have to make camp himself before turning back the next day. Doing this multiple times was no problem at all. He was always well equipped had a satellite phone with him so he could easily call out if there was any trouble or could be reached as well. As a professional, Jonathan always made plans for everything, but it was one of these hikes that would prove to be near fatal. It will show that even the most experienced of men would lose in a direct battle with mother nature. Jonathan knew this and despite his best attempt, there was only so much he could do against the force of the earth. 
Taking his truck, Jonathan drove all the way out to the edge of the campground and began hiking his way down to the Chikuni River. He followed it, heading down to where he had left his last marker. He was hoping he would be able to get further down and do some sightseeing before he would turn back the next day. As he continued down the river, he looked across with his binoculars and saw them for the first time. Three bears, a mama, and two smaller cubs. They were on the other side of the river, munching on some fish which the mother had snatched from the river. Jonathan took out his camera and took a photo and recorded a video on his phone, trying to get the best shot he could. Afterwards, he continued heading down until he came to the tree where he tied a piece of cloth to remind himself of how far he had gotten. He pulled it loose and stuffed it in his bag before continuing into uncharted territory. He took in the scenic view, taking photos as he went along, reveling in how peaceful it was out there. By four, he stopped and began setting up shelter, using the small deployable tent which he had carried in his bag. Once he set up, he held it down with rocks and covered it in dried grass and twigs before heading back to the side of the river. Using a stick and line of twine, he was able to catch some small fish. He took his quarry further downstream before he built a small fire to cook the fish. He knew the smell would attract animals to his location, so he made sure that he cooked all of it at once and ate it right there. The rest of it was stored in a tightly sealed flask which he took with him and headed back to the spot where he'd set up the tent. Once in, he decided to retire for the night. Six hours into the night, Jonathan heard pawing on his tent. Listening intently, he realized that there was something outside. He stayed still, hoping that the creature would simply go away after it had fulfilled his curiosity. He could not see it through the walls of the tent, but the force of the creature had told him exactly what it was. Thirty minutes later, there was silence, and the creature seemed to be retreating. Jonathan knew that he had not agitated it, and it only wanted to know what the tent was. Once he was certain that the creature was gone, he sat up and ran his hands along the sides of the tent, making sure that it had not been ripped through by the sharp claws of the creature. He found a few slashes on the side, but they weren't enough to affect the integrity of the tent. A low growling sound from the side of the tent reached his ears, and he realized that the bear was not alone. The mother bear he had seen across the river had come all the way down there, and it was not happy with whatever his tent was. Its jaws clamped down on one of the support beams of the tent and began pulling it. Jonathan held on for dear life inside the small tent as it pulled him. He tried reaching for the rifle, but it was dark, and the force with which he was being pulled caused things to go tumbling around in the tent. Suddenly, the wall of the tent ripped free from where the bear had slashed through it, and Jonathan fell right through. He realized that he was outside and instantly took off running, but he was unable to get far in the darkness as he tripped over a branch and fell face first onto the ground. Jonathan took a breath and put both his hands over the back of his head and spread his legs, trying to regulate his breathing. He knew that if he played dead, the creature would most likely let it be. He heard the three bears rushing toward him, their paws pounding against the mulched earth. The creatures reached him and instantly began clawing at his back. Jonathan groaned in pain, doing his best to stay still as they continued their assault on him. Their claws slashed through his shoulder blades and the younger cubs tore bits of flesh off him. Jonathan held out as long as he could, taking the pain through tears. Eventually, he passed out from the pain the next morning, the bears were gone, and Jonathan was alive. However, he was unable to move and was in severe pain, with his entire back covered in bites and cuts. Luckily, he was found by hikers from another camp later that evening and was quickly taken by helicopter to a nearby hospital. By some miracle, Jonathan survived, despite losing a lot of blood. For several months, he was completely unable to use his right arm. However, he was able to make a full recovery with only slight issues using the arm. Jonathan still returns to the same forest where he was attacked, and while he doesn't go alone, he will forever live with the scars and pain of the grizzly attack.
The Wilson family spends their summers driving their recreational vehicle to nearby lakes to have their vacation. This time, they park their RV beside Cultus Lake in British Columbia. Today is the family's second day at Cultus Lake, and everything has been going great. This time, the family would be swimming at the lake. The father and mother, Philip and Mira, invited their three teenage children, Apollo, Jennifer, and Macy, to swim with them at the lake. Only Jennifer and Macy told their parents they'd swim with them, while Apollo refused and decided to stay inside their RV. As the rest of the family swims at the lake, Apollo plays with his phone inside the RV. He kept the vehicle's entrance open just so his family could enter any time they finished swimming or if they had to get something inside. While Apollo was playing on his phone with his headphones on, he suddenly felt the RV shake, which startled him. He thought it was an earthquake, so he took off his headphones to check it out. When the shaking stopped, he shrugged it off and put his headphones back on before playing on his phone again. As soon as he continued playing, the RV shook again. He was scared Apollo this time. He took off his headphones again and stood up from his seat, only to see a grizzly bear inside with him already. Apollo freaked out at the sight of the grizzly bear and screamed for help, as his family outside couldn't hear him that much because they were swimming at the far side of the lake. As soon as he screamed, the grizzly was also startled, making it more aggressive toward him. The grizzly squeezed itself through the quarters of the RV to reach Apollo, as Apollo was screaming and was trying to take a few steps backward to avoid the bear. When the bear got closer, it immediately reached for Apollo's chest to claw it, but Apollo luckily dodged the attack, and only the tip of his claws reached him. However, it still hurt his chest slightly. While swimming back to the shore to see how Apollo was doing, Philip suddenly became aware of the RV's constant shaking. Mira and the two daughters also swam back as Philip rushed inside the RV, only to see a grizzly bear trying to reach Apollo. Philip was terrified and didn't know what to do until he decided to jump at the bear's back and yank it by the ear. As Philip did so, the bear growled and moved its body side to side, shaking the RV even more. When Philip senses this would be a great chance, he suddenly gouges the bear's eyes, causing it to drop Philip on the floor and run away outside the RV. After the bear got away, Philip checked on Apollo, who the raging grizzly bear from earlier slightly hurt. They drove away from Cultus Lake afterward to get Apollo treated and swore never to return to the place again. Today's story takes us to the wild and scenic Salmon River of Idaho, cutting through the no-return wilderness and Frank Church River. It is one of the largest rivers in North America, running through 80 miles of wilderness and famous for its majestic appeal. It offers a chance for people to hunt, fish, and get away from civilization, to become immersed in the beauty of nature and all that it offers. With thick, lush forest and a thriving river flowing through it, it's a true paradise for all of the wildlife that calls this area their home. But sometimes, humans wander into territory that doesn't belong to them. When they wander out into such places, in their bid to find some fun and relaxation, they sometimes find themselves ensnared, fighting for their lives against the elements and the true landlords of the wilderness. Today, Sharon Cutler and her boyfriend Derek have decided to head out for some outdoor fun, but they choose the wrong part of the outdoors to camp, as the homeowner is not pleased with the invaders on his property. They are the largest predators in North America, and they were not willing to give a warm welcome to their guests. The couple arrived at their camping spot early, clearing the area which had been used by previous campers. They set up their tent first before heading out to the river to hunt some salmon. The young couple was carefree, more interested in the photos which they would take than in securing their environment. They took several photos by the water before they began fishing, sitting by the edge of the river while they tried to catch salmon. Unbeknownst to them, their loud noises and laughter had drawn the attention of a grizzly bear who was feeding just downstream. After fishing, they built a fire which they used to slow roast their meal, watching it cook as they took more photos. 
While they had the time of their lives, the grizzly watched from the shadows, staring at the couple from across the river. They were too engrossed in their own activities to see the near 600-pound creature that was watching them. The grizzly moved downstream, heading to a part of the water which it knew was shallow enough for it to cross over to the side of the river where the couple had picked as their spot. It stopped by the edge of the river, catching a salmon for itself, and munched on the small fish, making quick work of it. The grizzly's attention was then set on the humans and the sweet smell of roasted fish which filled the air. The couple spent most of the afternoon out, and by evening, they were exhausted. They returned to their tent after properly storing their leftovers in coolers, which would hide the scent. They managed to pull off some proper camp etiquette, not because they were aware of the bears, but just because they had been taught to do so. With grizzly and black bears being responsible for the death of fewer than 50 people in the United States, the chances of the couple getting attacked were low, and they were more interested in their late night frolic than anything else. It took the bear some time to make it across the river and back up the side of the riverbank to where the couple had set their tent. In the dark, the creature had to rely on its nose and keen eyesight to find them. Regardless of their well-stored food, the creature could still pick up on light traces in the air and followed them right to the couple's tent. Sharon and Derek had long since exhausted themselves and had fallen asleep with smiles on their faces. A day of adventure well spent, and their minds set for the morning when they would return home. As they slept, the grizzly moved through the camp. They had put the cooler off to the side of the tent, and the bear went straight for it. The determined creature clawed at it for a few seconds, trying to get the lid open, but was unsuccessful. It nudged it with the side of its head, looking to break it, but still failed to do so. Having one of the strongest bite forces in the animal kingdom at over 900 PSI, it bit right through the box, ripping away at the layers until it got to the leftovers inside. The noise drew Sharon's attention. Quickly tapping Derek awake, they both peered through the tent to see the bear outside, feasting on what they had planned for breakfast. The bear was distracted by the food, not hearing their hushed whispers as they tried to figure out what to do. Deciding that it was best that they stayed in the tent, Sharon pulled out her smartphone and decided it would be best to take a photo. The shutter clicked and the flash went off, drawing the attention of the bear. The creature froze, turned around to face them, and let out a low roar. Sharon screamed, dropping her phone as she moved toward the back of the small tent. The bear was on them in a matter of moments, barreling into the tent and forcing the pegs to fly out of their anchor points. The tent tumbled off to the side as Sharon and Derek rolled for a bit before coming to a stop behind some bushes. The bear rushed after them, clawing and biting at the tent, trying to rip through it. Derek quickly looked around for his gun, but in the darkness, he could not find it. The tent had flipped multiple times and had left their things scattered in disarray. Sharon finally located the gun and handed it to him. Derek quickly pulled down the zipper and they both rushed out of the tent and took off running through the woods. Sharon screamed as she ran with Derek following close behind her. She tripped on a root and fell to the ground, rolling off into a ravine. Derek tried to go after her, but he tripped as well, twisting his ankle in the dark and bouncing his head off a rock. He was knocked out. The bear heard the cries of Sharon at the bottom of the ravine and began making its way down toward her, baring its teeth. She backed away in terror, feeling sand in her face. Her body ached from the fall and her elbow was painful, but she still found the strength to run. The creature slammed into her from behind, sending her back to the ground. It bit at her, catching the edge of her jeans and began pulling wildly. Sharon screamed, calling out to Derek was still unconscious up above her. The bear realized that it was not making progress with ripping through her jeans, so it swiped at her back, slicing through her shirt with its sharp claws. Sharon screamed louder, pulling herself into a ball as she sobbed, wondering if her fate was sealed. The bear then bit down on her scalp and began pulling her away by her hair. She punched at it, but cried out from the pain in her elbow as she then realized that it was broken. 
The bear pulled her with such ease, it was as if Sharon was a rag doll. Just as they got near the top of the ravine, Sharon heard Derek call out to her. She screamed again, letting him know where she was. Derek rushed over to the edge of the drop-off and looked down to see the bear dragging her off by her hair. He reached for his waistline and pulled the gun from where he had tucked it. It felt strange in his hands, but there was no time for him to stop to think. He slid down the side of the hill and aimed at the large creature, right for its head. He tried to level his breathing as he did back at the gun range, making sure his aim was true. Then he pulled the trigger. The lack of feedback stunned him, and so did the bright red light that shot out of the barrel of the gun. It struck the bear right between the eyes, and the bright light of the flare stunned the creature, causing it to let go of Sharon and run off into the wilderness. Sharon had picked up the wrong gun in the panic, grabbing a flare gun instead of his pistol, but it was just enough to keep them alive. As dawn broke, medical personnel arrived at the scene, taking them both to a hospital where they would live to tell the tale. An Australian biologist named Flynn, along with his guide Rasid, is on the beautiful island of Borneo to document the conservation status of the sun bear, a bear species considered the smallest in the world. The two of them are bound for the Borneo rainforest, a place known to be one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Flynn was enthusiastic about the trip and eager to learn more about the sun bears since they are quite an interesting bear species. As Flynn and Rasid are venturing into the forest, Rasid suddenly warned Flynn that sun bears can become aggressive and are relentless in their attacks. Flynn assures Rasid that he won't do anything to threaten the sun bears and that he has brought bear spray with him in case the sun bears won't be friendly to him. Rasid heaved a sigh of relief as the two of them continued to explore the rainforest with Rasid guiding Flynn along the way. After a couple of minutes of endless walking and exploring, Rasid finally spots an adult sun bear sleeping on a tree branch above them. Rasid pointed out the sun bear to Flynn who was amazed to note that this species of bears could climb trees just like the black bear. Flynn took out his camera to take pictures and videos documenting the sun bear. Afterward, he and Rasid were surprised when the bear suddenly woke up and stared straight down at them from above. Flynn asked Rasid if they should run, but Rasid could only stare at the bear even more to examine if it would attack them. After realizing it was only staring at them, Rasid suggested they continue their exploration to capture more footage of the sun bears. As they were walking, the most unexpected and unimaginable thing happened. In the blink of an eye, the sun bear they saw at the tree branch suddenly jumped on Flynn's back and tackled him face first on the ground. Rasid was startled as the small bear growled in anger and began clawing Flynn's back, causing him to groan loudly. Flynn tried to move his body and stand up to fight off the smaller bear, but surprisingly, it had a heavy weight that kept him pinned on the ground. Rasid wanted to get the bear spray from Flynn, which he told him about earlier, but he didn't know where to find it since the bear was all over Flynn's back. Determined, Rasid desperately grabbed a nearby tree branch that had been broken off a tree and decided to use it as a weapon against the vicious sun bear. As the sun bear kept attempting to bite and claw Flynn, Rasid immediately went near it and bashed its head with the tree branch, considering it was thick and heavy. The bear growled, got off Flynn, and this time went for Rasid. But before the bear could lay its long clawed paws at Rasid, he hits the sun bear's face with the branch as hard as he can until it collapses on the ground. As soon as the bear went unconscious, Rasid helped Flynn to get up and reported the incident to the authorities. After the incidents, authorities searched for the sun bear that attacked Flynn and Rasid to put it in the Bornean Sun Conservative Center so that the bear wouldn't cause harm anymore and would be kept in captivity. The story for today's video takes us to Canada's largest, coldest, and northernmost region, Nunavut, which is its tundra territory with a cold, remote, and craggy environment, home to 28,000 Inuit people. Many tourists are fascinated by the weather conditions and the locals' way of living here. 
It gained fame due to its frigid temperatures and is a popular place to catch a glimpse of the northern lights and spot unique animals such as narwhals, seals, walruses, beluga whales, and the most anticipated and feared of them all, the ferocious polar bear. People who want to view a polar bear up close and in the wild frequently travel to Nunavut. Polar bears are considered residents of this place as they can freely roam in areas where they want to. However, they are hunted down by Nunavut hunters in case they would begin to attack people, as countless cases of polar bear attacks within this territory have been recorded ever since. Given that polar bears are the strongest, most powerful, and most aggressive of all bear species, there's no surprise that they would bring terror to the residents and even tourists of Nunavut. In this video, we'll feature a horrifying true story of a woman who got attacked by a polar bear while studying beluga whales in Pond Inlet, an Inuit hamlet within Nunavut. A wildlife researcher named Aldina Moore was sent to Nunavut with 12 other researchers to study beluga whales, the sea canaries of the ocean. Since she knew about them, Aldina had been deeply interested in learning about beluga whales and would grab any chance to see and check them out up close. Aldina was mesmerized by the sight of the surroundings as Yotimo and Hanta showed them some beautiful views along their motorboat ride. Aldina took countless photographs of the animals and sights she and the other researchers saw while sailing to their campsite. Upon arriving at their campsite near the coast, Yotimo and Hanta helped Adina and the researchers set up their camp. There were individual sleeping bags for all researchers, a huge research tent and a table to eat, and many boxes full of food, supplies, and gear, and other essentials needed for their research expedition to study beluga whales. After doing all the work and setting up their camp, Aldina decided they should all take a rest before setting up the net they'll be using to catch a beluga whale. Once they've finally seen one, they will only take intimate photographs of its body, take blood samples, examine its behavior, and possibly record clips of its sound. After half an hour, they will release the whale with no harm inflicted. Aldina went to Yotimo and Hanta to ask about the location's conditions and whether or not it caused any hazards while resting. Hanta told Adina that there were also tourists. They led to the camp and got home safely in no time. After hearing those, Aldina was convinced that the place was completely safe. However, Yotimo warned her immediately of polar bears. Polar bears are native to these areas, Yotimo began as he spoke. Our tourists might get home alive and safe, but they also got home scared and terrified because they saw a polar bear," he added. Confused, yet filled with curiosity, Aldina began to ask Yotimo some questions. Do you have any idea what happened to those tourists? Why are they so terrified of polar bears? What did the polar bears do to them? She asked. Yotimo sighed as he pointed out a spot at a distance and told Adina to look at it. He told Adina that it was where polar bears usually go and where tourists usually saw them at some point. Adina was quite surprised at how close the spot was to their camp. Hanta assured Aldina that the polar bears go to that spot to cool down or eat food they gathered from hunting in other parts of the fjord. As long as Aldina and the other researchers won't do something that may threaten or provoke them, they'll be fine. And again, Aldina was convinced that everyone would be safe if she stuck to what Yotimo and Hanta had said. After her conversation with the two Inuits, she told the others they should start setting up the particular net they made to catch one beluga whale. Another researcher named Evan decided to carry out the plan of getting the net into the water. Together with four other male researchers, they set up the trap before steering it into the water to drop it. Once the net had been dropped, Aldina told the other researchers that they should monitor it for 24 hours a day. And to do this, they should have rotating shifts every three to four hours. The other researchers agreed as they started watching the net for signs of a beluga whale. Aldina assigned herself to do the afternoon shift, to which most researchers agreed. She took a quick nap until one of the researchers woke her up when it was finally her turn to watch the net. She sat down on a portable chair with two other researchers named Rita and Nicholas and began their shift. While watching, the three of them casually talked about polar bears instead of beluga whales. The two were curious about how big a polar bear could get. 
while Aldina was slightly disturbed by the thought of seeing a huge predator up close. She told the other two that polar bears are highly aggressive and will not hesitate to kill. After the small talk, Aldina excused herself to go to a nearby spot as she saw two seals going to the coast. She quickly grabbed her camera and took pictures of the seals. It was a rare moment to see seals up close, and Aldina would never miss a chance to document them. Suddenly, Aldina felt something strange in her surroundings. She felt like something had been following her the entire time she's documenting the seals at the coast. She tried to look around and roam around the place to find out if something was following her, or if it was just her intuition. Aldina spotted what she was trying to avoid a polar bear. She couldn't determine if the bear was near or far from her, but she could only assume that the bear was meters away from her. Scared but still fascinated, Aldina slowly tried to take a picture of the bear when it suddenly started to walk towards her. Terrified, Aldina freaked out and decided to run for the camp, but it was too late. As soon as she started running was the moment the bear ran swiftly and caught her in its huge paws in no time. She had no idea that polar bears are this fast and quick when capturing their prey. Aldina began to scream as the polar bear immediately pinned her down to the ground and scratched her torso, causing excruciating pain. She tried squirming her body to escape from the huge animal, but it only caused her to end up lying on her back, giving more access to the polar bear to leave scratches and wounds on her body. Aldina once again screamed for help. The other researchers heard her this time and decided to rush to her. As the researchers were running to help her, the polar bear continued to claw Aldina's back as she was protecting her nape from being scratched despite the pain she's been feeling. After clawing at her for a while, the polar bear stopped and jumped on her body. It then stomped on her several times. When the researchers arrived at the scene, Evan brought out a rifle that he was given and aimed a shot at the polar bear. Due to the quick movements of the polar bear, it missed, but the rifle's sound was so loud that it immediately startled the animal. When Evan noticed this, he fired another shot beside the polar bear, which made it run away from them instantly, leaving Aldina conscious and wounded. They immediately called a plane to come and pick them up to take Aldina to Ikala, the only city within Nunavut, as it has a medical facility. There, Aldina received more than 400 stitches for her wounds and was provided with intense treatment to recover from her severe injuries from the polar bear attack. The research expedition that Aldina's team had been doing was canceled due to what happened. After the incident, Nunavut hunters came together at the place to hunt for the polar bear that attacked Aldina, so it won't harm any more tourists. Luckily, Aldina made it out alive and was on her way to recovery. The story is about a hiker named Eleanor Lewis and her son Caleb Lewis. Their morning journey on a Wyoming hiking trail ended in disaster. Eleanor was a hiker for more than 20 years and has been teaching her 16-year-old son Caleb for a while now. The two have been on different hiking trips, serving as their mother and son bonding. For their morning hike, they decided to go on a Wyoming hiking trail, which is famous for frequent bear sightings. At first, Caleb was skeptical about the hike as he knew that they could have an encounter with a bear later on. He suggested they bring two cans of bear spray to prepare for a potential bear attack, which Eleanor did right after being told by Caleb. As they started their morning hike, Eleanor and Caleb had a great time. They brought cameras to take pictures of the environment and footage of some wildlife they had encountered on their way. It was a peaceful morning hike until they stumbled upon a meadow and spotted a giant grizzly bear with its cubs in the distance. The two strolled in the meadow as they watched the mother grizzly take care of its cubs. Caleb wanted to turn back, but his mother, Eleanor, insisted they continue on the trail since the bears would follow them. Caleb grew nervous and picked up his bear spray just in case. Eleanor and Caleb tried their best to walk slowly and not make noise, as grizzly bears have excellent hearing. As unfortunate as they could get, Eleanor stepped on a pile of leaves, causing the mother grizzly to look at them. The two froze at their place instantly as the bear made eye contact with them while slowly approaching. 
Caleb started to scream and make noises to let the bear know that he was human, hoping to make it back away and return to its cubs. Unfortunately, the bear became agitated and began charging in his direction. They started rushing in the direction the bear was coming from out of panic. When Caleb saw the bear approaching, he charged it with bear spray before attacking his mother, Eleanor. Eleanor screamed as the bear tackled her face first down on the ground and began biting her arms and backpack. Caleb grabbed the nearest wooden stick he could find and poked the bear right in the eye, which made the bear growl in pain and get off Eleanor. The bear spray also took effect as the bear kept growling in discomfort. Seconds later, it backed away and disappeared from the two of them. Caleb helped his wounded mother stand up as the two struggled to hike back to where they had started. Even though Eleanor suffered from wounds, cuts, and lacerations from the bear's attack, she is still thankful that she could make it home alive despite the terrifying encounter.